I want to thank Ed and Colleen for having me and inviting me here to speak with you guys. Um, as I've told you, I, I spent uh, about 17 years as a writer, a reporter, and editor uh, for um, the Gazette, the Eagle Tribune, and the Boston Herald. Um, I retired, I guess you'd say, from uh, the newspaper business a few years ago, and I actually started uh, about five years ago my own <coughs> janitorial services company. And uh, I knew eventually that I would leave the, the uh, journalism business and, and start the uh, go into the, the uh, actually cleaning field uh, full time. So I did so about two years ago. But while I was in the newspaper business, I worked um, in various capacities, mostly in sports, but I also did uh, arts and entertainment and features as well. Um, at the time I left college in 1989, I got hired by the Herald. And I worked there for five years, and then uh, at the same time my father got sick, he, he ended up uh, getting Parkinson's, and I moved back home, so I took a job at the Gazette, and following that, <clears throat> my father died, so I worked, uh, I went to work at the Eagle Tribune uh, for two or three years, and then eventually returned to the, uh, to the Herald, and spent another five, five and a half years there. Um, <clears throat> at the time, um, when, when, I was in this, when I was in the industry, it was a pretty, uh, it was a pretty dynamic, fast-paced environment. It, it probably still is. The reason I left was I, I felt that it was sort of a, a dying industry. It wasn't anything that had, um, it seems, uh, a bright future. You, may, you, you all may read the newspaper uh, on a daily basis, but the fact is that a lot of people don't. Newspaper circulation is declining uh, every day, and the main, the main reason for that is the internet. And I don't think newspapers really. Uh, caught on to the internet until it was about 10 years past when they should have. Like, I, I read the Globe every day, um, and I just read it right here. I don't have to go to the store and get the paper or go, go outside to get it. I can just fire up my phone <coughs> and read whatever story I want, the same thing that's in the paper. Um, the one thing I don't get there is the advertising. Newspapers are driven by advertising, and that's one of the reasons when people turn to the internet, they don't see the ads that are in the print side of the uh, publication. So those ads, those giant ads for cars, which really drive the newspaper that provides them with a great source of revenue, the furniture ads as well, people just don't see them. And as a result, <coughs> uh, their worth is, is uh, de decreased every day. Um, while, I was in, while I was in the sports department, that was probably, um, that was the most fun I've had uh, of any of the sections that I worked for, any, any of the work that I did. I, I did uh, at the Herald for the Pat, for the, last three or four years I was there, I wrote a blog. That's short for weblog, which is uh, an internet diary. Uh, I would write just about anything I wanted. Um, they gave me uh, freedom to do so, which was very nice. I could comment on uh, whether it was the Bruins, the Celtics, Patriots, Red Sox, uh, Boston College, whatever, whatever I wanted, I could write about that. And, and um, <clears throat> it, was pretty, it was pretty fun and entertaining. And I actually got pretty positive feedback. I would get emails from people in California, New Mexico, all over the country, who would actually have a chance to read what I wrote uh, if I if I had done the same thing for the paper, they wouldn't have they wouldn't have ever seen it because the paper just wouldn't have gotten out there. Um, while I was while I did work in sports, I was able to um, interview, meet with, uh, talk to a lot of um, I guess you'd call them famous people. To me, they were just sort of interview subjects. I wasn't really awed by uh, any of these guys. I had, um, while I was in college, I got to be friendly with a guy um, who ended up um, playing first base for the Red Sox. And, and he um, wasn't famous then, but when he was with the Red Sox, he became famous to me. He was just still a, a buddy from school. And um, as a result, I never really had that uh, the gleam in the eye or the twinkle in the eye that so many of these guys get infatuated with these athletes. It just didn't mean um, a lot to me other than to try to pull whatever kind of quotes or information I could get out of them. Um, <clears throat> as a result, I, I would say that the best interview that I ever got was with Roger Clemens. I don't know, Roger Clemens is uh, back in the news yet again for his off-field work, I guess you'd say. <laughs> um, and, uh, when I had the chance to interview him, which I did, did twice, he was uh, he was great. I, I sat next to him for a half an hour both times. He looked me in the eye, gave me great answers. He didn't try to big time me. Um, 
he was very forthright and, and I felt honest. I mean, I didn't ask him about uh, performance enhancing drugs or uh, infidelity or anything like that. But uh, we, we stuck with baseball and college football. He's a big fan of the Texas Long Longhorns. And uh, he was very, he was very, very accommodating. Later on, uh, just a few minutes later, um, I had the misfortune to uh, try to interview Jose Canseco, who I would uh, felt that was the absolute worst uh, person that I've ever tried to interview, by far. Um, just a, uh, a miserable human being. And um, it turns out that uh, Canseco was probably one of the most honest people uh, ever to uh, wear a major league uniform because he, he essentially wrote a book that said that, uh, you know, yeah, he did take steroids for a long time. Um, yeah, they helped him hit home runs. And <clears throat> yeah, there are a lot of guys out there now that are still doing roids and uh, human growth hormone. So it's a, a strange uh, dichotomy. The guy that I thought was uh, very honest and open to me uh, ended up perhaps not being a little shady. And the guy that was just uh, a rude imbecile ended up being uh, quite honest and, uh, and forthright with, with uh, the situation in regards to uh, performance enhancing drug and uh, performance enhancing drugs. I did get to cover uh, baseball games live and football games live, basketball games, all sorts of activities that um, most people don't get from the perspective of press row, uh, whether it's right on the court or whether it's uh, high in the stands, behind glass. Um, a lot of the work that people don't realize is actually done for you. If you went to a Boston College football game, um, <coughs> you'd eat like this when you came in. Uh, you'd have programs and uh, information packets in front of you. You could find out anything you wanted about any particular players. And then at halftime, they would come around with a set of statistics that indicated every single uh, down and distance that occurred in the first half. At the end of the game, they'll do the exact same thing with the final statistics. So essentially what you're doing is taking information off sheets and combining it into a story. I mean, uh, the difference is if you're good at it, you can make the story worthwhile. If you're not good at it, it's going to be boring and, and people don't want to read it. And that's what I, I always try to make things that I wrote interesting to lure people in, to make them want to read it. I felt that sports were entertainment. That's what people watch them for. They're, they're children's games played by adults. And in a lot of cases, they're children's games played by children, so, um, even though they're, they're older. That's, that's the reality of the situation. I think that um, sports also prevent, uh, presents an opportunity for uh, people to view, um, view the world in a, uh, in a vacuum for two or three hours where you can shut out all sorts of problems and, and uh, misfortunes that have come to you and you can concentrate solely on the game. You can rise and fall with the dramatics of, of the event and um, come to enjoy it. It's an escape for a few hours and, and it's a, a passion for many of us here. I don't think that um, in my travels throughout America, I've never seen um, in any other part of the country uh, such passion that I see for the Red Sox. Um, traveled to Baltimore last September to go to the Sox game, and I literally walked from the hotel to uh, Camden Yards, which is about ten, a 10 minute walk. I didn't see a single person with an Orioles hat on. I saw probably 500 to 1,000 people with Red Sox hats or shirts on. And that's an amazing statistic because it was a home game for the Orioles, but I guess the citizens of Maryland or Baltimore didn't really care. The so for, the, for Sox fans, it was an opportunity to go to a game in a, in a, in a distant ballpark and root on their team. Um, you just don't get that. You don't really get that in any, any other place in America. That's why we're very fortunate to see, uh, to see these guys here. And that's why so many of us uh, love them. It's such a, a, a lifelong attachment to them. And <clears throat> for me, I think um, the attachment was strong enough that uh, when I got out of the business um, a few years ago, I still love the Red Sox. There are, uh, there are many sports writers who don't want to uh, have their teams win that they cover because it, it forces them to work more, whether it's in the postseason, whether it's in spring training, whether it's uh, opportunities uh, that they have to write about the team uh, in the offseason. Um, and I think that, that that cynical attitude was one of the, a small reason that I uh, ended up leaving business altogether. But um, for me, it just, it's just fun to go to a game 
and sit there and not have to have a notebook in my hand or not have to go and, and, and speak to someone after the game. Um, I always liked to watch sports. As a little kid, I, I did it. And I'm glad that, as an adult that I didn't uh, have to give that up. So it's, just a, it's, it's, a fun, it's a fun way to kill a couple hours. That's really all I would have uh, to say you know, in general terms about this kind of thing. So I'll, uh, if you guys want to ask some questions, I'm sure you have some kind of questions for me. Can, can is fire you away. Playing, are you young or you is? Yeah, I, I played a, a lot of sports when I was younger, baseball, basketball, soccer, football, yeah. Um, right on through college, I played rugby in college. <clears throat> My college didn't have a football team, so I played rugby. That was kind of fun. You had a question. Yeah, uh, there used to be a lot of hockey Bruins players, like Bobby Orr and Eddie Johnson when he owned that club out there. They were always around town. I used to see Terry O'Reilly when I was a kid uh, riding his bike right through town. Um, I saw him a couple of weeks ago to talk to, talk to him. I, I think I threw his kid a vote uh, yeah. last fall. Uh, probably will do so again because I think I saw some signs somewhere. I, yeah. If I can perform yeah, 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 again. Yeah. I don't know. What, is he running for town council? Or? Select, yeah. Select okay, okay, so I won't get to vote for him this time. Maybe. Well, most of the most of the Bruins years ago, when Jack Thompson had the star of the Bucks, uh, most of the Bruins come from Canada. Yeah, the Bruins. Uh, a lot of them have lived in this area. The old for, Bruins. Yeah, the old for Bruins. a long, long time. Yeah. Like that kid from Hamel. Sure, yeah. That kid from Hamel plays from Tampa Bay. Coco Finn, uh, he's a good player. I actually had a friend. Uh, it was a weird thing. I, I had a friend who was um, uh, that I worked with at the Herald. Um, named, named Jim Barrasso, and um, Jim was a, a very good writer um, who also played uh, high school and college hockey. Um, unfortunately for him, he wasn't as good as his brother, uh, who played goalie for the Penguins. And uh, the weird thing was that Jim was a writer who actually spoke all the time. Um, his brother, when he was a goalie for the Penguins, uh, refused to talk to the media. <laughs> it's kind of a strange situation. Um, I think, I think Mark Bavaro, when he played tight end, um, didn't talk to the media either. And his sister, I think, at some point, was the spokesman for the sheriff's department. So sister was quoted in the paper all the time. Uh, but Mark just didn't want to talk to the media, so he didn't do it. So that's kind of a, I always thought those things were kind of funny, where one sibling would talk and another one just didn't feel any interest in doing so. You were talking about talking with the, the press. Jim Rice. <clears throat> Jim Rice never talked to the press, really, from what he understood. He should be in the Hall of Fame. Is it because he didn't have that rapport with the press that they're not voting for him, do you think? Um, I think Jim Rice didn't talk to the press, but I don't think that probably hurts his candidacy enough at this point um, that that is keeping him out of the Hall of Fame. I, I think that sports reporters uh, can be petty and vindictive like anybody else, but over time, I don't think that's a reason that someone could look themselves in the mirror and say, no, I'm not going to vote for Jim Rice because he didn't speak with me after a game once. Ted th Williams has some ducks on that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, Ted Williams was not yeah. uh, a friendly guy to the media. I, I, think, in Rice, I, I think in Rice's case, um, I think eventually he will get in. Um, I think that what the real issue is uh, that people can look at his statistics and say, for about 10 years, um, 75 to 86 or 11 years, he was probably the best hitter in the game. Um, and after that, he kind of fell off the map and was done by 89. So I think people, I think sports writers look at it and say, he was dominant for uh, a decade, a little over a decade, but he wasn't, he wasn't dominant for longer than that. And I think that TV. he was good on TV. He's good on TV. I, I enjoy yeah, listening to him. I, um, but I, I think that eventually he will get in, and um, I, I vote for him in a second. I, I mean, I, I think he's uh, one of the premier players of his era, and um, you know, he just lost. Uh, I don't know if it was his eyesight or his uh, his wrists were always strong. Uh, for whatever reason, around uh, '89, he just he just uh, lost it and, and refused to hang on. I mean, if he hung on and hit, uh, I think he finished around 389 home runs. If he had hung on and, and got to 400, he probably would be in the Hall of Fame at this point, because that's a baseline number. You're assured that he didn't do steroids. You know that he was uh, very solid, and he probably would be in. Um, he, I, I think 
he will get in someday. If, if Tony Perez is in uh, for the Cincinnati Reds and Montreal Expos and the Red Sox, um, Rice, Rice uh, should be in and probably will get in. How about, how about um, Doug Flutie? He did a great job with the Boston College. And he, when he was with the Patriots, I used to go to all the games. And, uh, I got an invite to go in the locker room. I met him and the coach. They played Chicago and they beat Chicago. Man, that coach did go was using some custom language down there. Yeah. He came out the hallway and everybody saw him and he went back and he was like, oh shit. That was the end of that. Flutie was. Uh, yeah. I thought he was great. He was great, yeah. I mean, he, he uh, his problem in the NFL was that he wasn't tall enough to see over def uh, yep. to, yeah. to see over the defensive line. And when they when they come in, they were told to put their hands up because he was only about as tall as me, and uh, he wasn't able to get the ball high enough over those guys to really throw across the middle. So what they'd have to do is use rollouts on either side for him to sort of get into an open position and, and move the ball downfield. But um, he was. Uh, you know, Doug Flutie was, was such a uh, good athlete that his, his last year, if he <coughs> didn't win the Heisman Trophy and, and they didn't beat Miami, he was actually going to play for the Boston College basketball team that season. Uh, that's, a, that's what a great athlete he was. Russell didn't make many mistakes, but he made that one a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, I was going to say, though, uh, um, Flutie there, uh, practically uh, injury-free uh, career, and he will play with 21, 20, 21 years. Yeah. He never, no one ever got a good hit on him because he was always shifting or moving. You know? he, yeah. never was, he was never a stationary target. The most. Uh, he never played Notre Dame. The, the athlete that impressed me the most, and I've met several, was uh, back in the 50s, 60s. I was uh, uh, at an insurance meeting, I was chairing out at the Hotel Syracuse, and we had, uh, we had two speakers. Uh, one was a guy who ended up being President Nixon, of course, we won't say anything about that. <laughs> but the other speaker was Jackie Robinson, yeah. and, and Jackie Robinson came, and uh, the most impressive individual did you ever meet him or see him? I was uh, about six when he died. So. In, in person? Uh, I, I was taller than him, but he was wide. But he, uh, he, he came with his wife, Rachel. He was living in Stanford, Connecticut. And uh, his wife had to come with him because I think of a diabetic. He was all, a, a blind. 90% blind, but he came in and he was immaculate with his uh, gray hair, gray hair, his dark hair and his gray hair, and a handsome individual, and uh, he got up and spoke uh, to the crowd about his career, and then <coughs> his college in California, and so forth, and his wife spoke to us afterwards. Come to find out, it was just prior to that they had lost their oldest son. The car accident? Is that what it was? I, I thought it was for uh, drugs. Drugs, and and a loss of son. But he was a most impressive individual I ever met. He was. Uh, uh, people forget, uh, like Jim Brown. Um, Jackie Robinson was a, was a multi-sport athlete. Uh, well, I, I think when he was at UCLA, he was on the, uh, I said all the UCLA uh, track records, and then also played on the football team, in addition to being um, a baseball player. Yeah. Jim Brown was an exceptional athlete at Syracuse. He played lacrosse uh, and also basketball. He was probably um, one of the nation's uh, greatest lacrosse players of all time. I'm sure if they had uh, a pro lacrosse league when Jim Brown played, uh, football, he probably in the spring would have played professional lacrosse. And yeah. He removed all doubt that he was the, the best athlete our nation's ever produced, I think. Did you ever meet him? Jim Brown I met once. Yeah. I, uh, when he was going to Syracuse, big guy. when he was going to Syracuse, I had, I lectured at uh, University of Syracuse, in North Syracuse. And uh, uh, that evening, I ended up in a bar. And it was Mario's, 
in Syracuse, New York. I didn't go to many bars, but... <laughs> and uh, we were sitting in the bar, this is the truth, and in came three black guys. Well, the first thing that caught my eye was the size of them. I mean, they were big, I mean, wide, you know. And there's one that I got talking with, really a handsome looking individual. It was Jim Brown. And we got talking and he was telling me about, he, he came from out there in the Long Island, that area. And his father and mother problems, broken home and all of this stuff, you know. And he, he told me about the uh, lacrosse and so forth. And, but he was a most impressive, you know, and you see him today, he looks, of course, kind of beat up. But, but he, was, uh, he was a handsome individual and big. And he had, the guy he had with him was Ernie Davis. Remember Ernie Davis sure. that yeah. died? Yeah. Yeah, he was with him that night. There was, a, uh, I think Ernie Davis had actually gone to, um, uh, he had gone to my prep school. Uh, yeah. In Maine, and uh, I remember being in the headmaster's office once uh, and seeing an autographed picture from Ernie Davis yeah. uh, when he was in the NFL, and it said, uh, you know, thank you for taking care of me, whatever. Um, and I asked the guy, I said, what, do you, what does this mean? Thank you for taking care. It was, it, uh, it wasn't perhaps those words, but it was yeah. indicative of that uh, he got some kind of treatment there that uh, that he was sort of shielded from something. Yeah, I think Ernie Davis's sister was Angela Davis, who was uh, uh, some sort of uh, he's a fuzzy haired one. Yeah, was some sort of black militant back in the '60s, and uh, I guess there were threats on her life. Uh, I wish she was some yeah. Black Panther or something. Yeah. and there were threats on her life. So Ernie was a great football player, and they actually uh, packed him off to this remote part of Maine uh, to let him uh, go there, so he would be uh, essentially protected. Uh, with his football career, he'd, he'd get to go to uh, Syracuse and play, um, and uh, when things when things cooled down, he'd go to Syracuse to play, and then uh, on to the NFL. He had this. He had the speed. Ernie Davis, very fast. He was in track too. Yeah. But uh, of course, Jim Brown was a bulldozer. Yeah, Jim Brown. I I would say was the the uh, the best athlete <coughs> that America has ever had. I don't I don't know if we'll ever see. Yeah. A guy yeah. uh, like him again. He, I, I think I saw an old boxing uh, writer once say that um, if Jim Brown had been trained as a young kid uh, on how to fight, he probably could have been the heavyweight champion you know, at the same time that Ali was. He, so, only had, he only had about 10 years in the pros, a very short career. Yeah, he hit hard though, and he came through the Oh, yeah, but so, uh, for know, him. That's probably why. And he, and he had a tough, tough mentor, uh, Paul Brown, in Cleveland. When I was in high school and uh, back in the 40s, uh, Marblehead at that time used to have tremendous football teams. And they used to go to uh, Edison High in Miami, they go to New York. And finally the coach, Charlie McGinnis, who was a super coach, never played a day of football in his life. He somehow t uh, got to know Paul Brown, and he went out to Massillon, Ohio. Well, remember Brown was the coach of Massillon, yeah. and, 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 and uh, Marvel had played him, and uh, well, they lost. They lost by a point, I think it was. It was that close. But that's when Paul Brown went on to Cleveland from there. Massillon's High School, I think, is the Pro, Pro Football Hall of Fame. Yeah. Uh, the school is actually built into the football field where you don't have to leave the school to enter the football stadium. You just walk through like yeah. a facility like this and you're into the, into the stadium. It's one of the, you know, one of the uh, country's best high school yeah. uh, football fields just because they're so crazy about high school football and, and Maslin and, and uh, yeah, well, their the coach, surrounding areas yeah. in Ohio. Their coach went right on from Massillon to Notre Dame, remember? Yeah, I, I had read that. Um, yeah, I mean, there, there were several coaches from Maslin who, who went on uh, to become NFL coaches and, and major yeah, college but this coaches. One, he went to Notre Dame. He wasn't that successful in about three years. Yeah. Uh, what, what you're thinking of um, was Jerry Faust. Yeah. Yeah. But he, in that area of, of Ohio, you know, 
you can go to a, a football game at uh, Georgetown High or, or Pentucket, and you know, maybe you'll get a thousand if, if you're lucky. A big, big day on Thanksgiving, you might get two thousand. But in Massillon, for example, you, um, a Friday night, you would get ten or twelve thousand folks there. For a big playoff game, they have to host it in, in a, uh, a college uh, at a college field. And it'd probably be fifteen or twenty thousand. Well, you have a lot of steel workers, son. Oh, steel yes. workers. Texas is like that. Yeah, Texas is like that as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, if there's no more questions, then we can. Uh, All right. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.